Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we're exploring the wonderful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England. We've decided to revisit the centre of the region and find some hidden gems, places that are not quite so famous, but still just as beautiful. And you find Ross, Widget, Gizmo and me in this wonderful village of Barrington. In the wind, you can probably hear the wind in the background. It's very windy day today, although beautiful and sunny. These two villages, the Barringtons, live opposite one another across opposite sides of the river. They are extremely beautiful and classic Cotswold. Part of the reason they look so beautifully unspoiled is that they've been in the hands of one family for a very long time. We're going to show you around. I'm going to tell you a bit all about it. Come with us. Slightly unusually on this occasion, I'm going to read to you an extract from Evan's book, The Wonderful Highways and Byways from Oxford and the Cotswolds, that we've been following for some years and we are now finally completing his journey. Uh, it's been a huge success for us, this, and we are producing in March uh, 2023 uh, an audio book of the wonderful book that Evans wrote. Uh, but on this occasion, I'm going to read to you his passage on the Barringtons, these beautiful villages, and I hope you enjoy it. The two Barringtons lie opposite each other on either side of the Windrush and are connected by a causeway erected by Thomas Strong of London. At the southern or little Barrington end is the Fox Inn, where a cup of good cider can be obtained and a comfortable lunch. While it's getting ready, we may visit the village of Little Barrington, the houses of which are scattered in a rather haphazard fashion on the banks of a deep green hollow, a swamp in winter and treacherous even in summer, while the church overlooks the Windrush some little distance on the left. It is a small, rather dumpy edifice, much disfigured by poor stained and painted deal furniture in the most atrocious style. If the whole were swept away, including pulpit and desk, and the ordinary church chairs substituted, the interior would be as charming in the, as the exterior. You descend into the church by seven steps, through a bold Norman doorway. Opposite you, in the north aisle, is a fine octagonal font, with the carvings on one of its facets hacked away. This north aisle seems to have been originally merely a lean-to, but when the tower was built at its western end, the walls were raised and it was promoted to a regular roof of its own. Its east window, with a transom, is particularly pleasing. As I have just hinted, if proportion is not to be insisted on, the general effect of the exterior is good, and is enhanced by the proximity on the west of a delightful old gabled house, shrouded in creepers and standing in a well-kept garden. Since we last saw the Windrush at Borton, it has become quite a considerable stream, and worthy to be the home of the large trout that are taken between this spot and Burford. It comes sweeping down through Barrington Park to the bridge at the farther end of Thomas Strong's Causeway, and then onwards through the wide green meadows to join the Thames at Newbridge. The park at Great Barrington may rival its neighbour at Sherborne in beauty. The house, which Rafe Bigland, Garter King at Arms, describes as an elegant structure of the Doric order, was built by Charles Talbot, George II's Lord Chancellor. His youngest son was the divine we have already met at Temple Guiting, and his eldest son, who made the grand tour, accompanied by James Thompson, the poet, died before Barrington came into the possession of his family. The estate was therefore inherited by the second son, who was created Earl Talbot, and who married Mary, daughter and heir, as a memorial tablet informs us, to Adam de Courtenel, secretary at war during several campaigns in Flanders to John, Duke of Marlborough. 
Their only surviving child, Cecil Talbot, married into the Carmarthenshire family of Rice and was raised to the peerage as Baroness Dynavor. The present Lord Dynavor is her descendant. As for the earldom of Talbot, it passed, by a fresh creation, to a nephew. If we enter the church, we shall find this tablet to the heiress of Cardinal in the chancel. It contains a fine medallion portrait by Nolikens, which must claim our admiration. But the most beautiful monument in the church is at the west end of the north aisle near the door. It is a pathetic memento of two children of the Brays who died of smallpox a disease which seems from the inscription to have been a particularly fatal one in that family. The monument consists of an elaborate group in marble representing a guardian angel with the children, a boy and a girl, the two latter attired in full dress of the days of Anne, the details of which, brocaded petticoat, laced coat, cravat and perique, are finished with the most conscientious minuteness. She died of the smallpox at her aunt Catchmays in Gloucester on Monday the 1 and 20th of May, 1711, in the eighth year of her age, much lamented. Her extreme good qualities having engaged the affections of all who knew her. He died of the smallpox upon Christmas Day, 1720, at the Royal Academy of Angers in France, in the fifteenth year of his age, so much esteemed for his good sense and fine temper that every gentleman of the Academy, foreigner as well as Britain, seemed to rival each other in paying just honours to his memory, and the beauties of his person were equal to those of his mind. In the North Isle lies the mutilated effigy of Captain Edmund Bray, clad in Tudor ruff and armour, with his sword on his right side. Sir Robert Atkins accounts for this peculiarity by a story that the captain, having unhappily killed a man and having been pardoned by Queen Elizabeth at Tilbury Camp, in token of his contrition, refused ever afterwards to use his right hand. If this is not a true story, and it certainly has an ex post facto air about it, one might be tempted to imagine that the tomb-maker had been guilty of an oversight, or that Captain Edmund, like Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, was a man left-handed. When Lord Chancellor Talbot purchased the estate in 1734, the Brays had been in possession for two centuries. They were a branch of the family from which the present Lord Bray is descended, and save in the troublesome times of the Civil War, they seem to have lived the happy, uneventful life of the country squire. Little or nothing is recorded of them beyond what may be gathered from their monuments, but in good King Charles's golden days, the peace of Barrington was broken by an outrage which was long remembered as one of the most disgraceful of the many escapades of its perpetrator. Fifty miles away, at Woburn House in Buckinghamshire, resided a veteran supporter of the parliamentary cause, Philip, the fourth Lord Wharton. A zealous Puritan himself, he had brought up his sons in the strictest principles of Calvinism. And, when the exiled monarch came to his own again, the eldest was a promising boy of twelve. He had doubtless already rebelled in secret against the stern parental discipline, and after a few years of intercourse with the fashionable world, he was able to throw off the yoke. In the words of Macaulay, he early acquired and retained to the last the reputation of being the greatest rake in England. The one tradition of his family to which he remained firm was its politics. Amid all his excesses, he was ever among the staunchest champions of his party. One of the strongest opponents of King James, and one of the strongest supporters of King William, and above all the writer of the telling and popular song, Lily Bolero, Honest Tom, as his admirers styled him, became the hero of the Whigs, 
and finally, by royal favour of the House of Hanover, Earl and Marquess of Wharton. In the summer of 1682, the future Marquess, now plain Mr. Thomas Wharton, and one of his brothers were visiting Sir Edmund Bray, an old cavalier, at Barrington Park. Sir Edmund kept a hospitable table and a good cellar, and one night, when the company had sat late over their bottle, and the host, and the more self-respecting guests, had, as it is only charitable to suppose, retired to bed, the drunken remnant, headed by the two brothers Wharton, sallied forth in quest of adventures. The house was close to the church, and the roisterers forthwith broke open the door, rang the bells backwardly or confusedly, cut the ropes, tore the Bible, broke down the pulpit, and committed many other horrible acts there. Having done with the church, they went on to make further havoc in the village, but by this time the alarm had been raised, and the inhabitants roused from their beds, drove them back to take refuge in the house. The Bishop of Gloucester, at this time the good Robert Frampton, was not the man to let a scandal of these dimensions pass unnoticed. Under threat of excommunication, he summoned the offenders to meet him at Stowe, where they made due submission and handed over a handsome fine, which was devoted to the work then in progress at Stowe Church. Among the cart papers preserved in the Bodleian Library is a touching letter from the bishop to Thomas Wharton written in the following November, in which he reminds him of the contrition he had expressed at Stowe, admonishes him of the evils which follow from the sin of drunkenness, and expresses his earnest hope that his promises of amendment will be fulfilled. Readers of Macaulay are aware that the good bishop's aspirations were not destined to be realised. In Barrington Church, everything is now decent and in order, but it has to be said, except for its sepulchral monuments and a large Norman chancel arch, the building is not particularly interesting. I hope you've enjoyed our visit to the lovely villages of Barrington. As you can see behind me, the great house lords it over this wonderful place. They are very, very beautiful. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can find us on all the now normal platforms. And we will see you again somewhere else in the Cotswolds in the very near future.